Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial and Michelle's co-host for this program. Thanks for joining us today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a 118 year old nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues of the day. Any views expressed are those of the speakers. Now the Commonwealth Club is producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. You can head over to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for all upcoming programs, plus podcasts and videos of past events. If you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box there to submit questions for our special guest today. Now I'd like to introduce Michelle Miao, the producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. Great to see you, John, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this awesome conversation. I'm so excited for it. Actually, I went back into my emails and, and uh, found out that I'd reached out to Matthew Rettenmund over five years ago, and so I've been waiting about five, six years for this interview. Our guest today is the author of Boy Culture, a novel originally published in 1995 that focuses on the adventures of a sex worker in Chicago, a gay sex worker. And it calls himself X to keep uh, anonymous. And we learn of all of his um, adventures and journeys. And like I mentioned, and so the novel was turned into a movie in 2006. And today it's a series. So here to talk about the success of Boy Culture is Matthew Renman. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I, I'm, I'm unaware of what happened five years ago, but apparently no doesn't mean no with me. I'm, I'm here. I'm happy to do it. No, no, you responded. You responded. And we, we had all these plans and you were working on, you know, several other projects. And you were like, oh, I think that, you know, we can wait a little bit so that we can talk about that project, but that project. And now six years later, all of those projects came to fruition. And here we are. Um, Classic. You know, so I'm much too busy. Going on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's tradition here on the program that we share a coming out story and we ask every single guest, whether they're LGBTQIA plus or not. And so if you'll do us the honor and share a coming out story. A coming out story. Um, well, the, the, the first person I ever came out to was my female best friend in high school. And the way I remember it was we had, we were invited to some kind of a, like a writing conference for high school students out of town. And so she drove me and I had been thinking about it for a long time. And I just remember on the ride home and everybody, I should add that everyone thought we were dating. And would consistently say, oh, you two are going to, you're, you're, you're dating, you're going to be married one day. And we would, I would say like, no, we're not. Uh, but I'm not really sure that she felt that way. So I finally felt like, you know what, before we get to that point where we actually are dating, I need to tell this person. And, and so I just kind of blurted it out. And she laughed, you know, nervous laughter. And then we both just laughed. And it was totally fine after that, um, especially with her. She was great. I'm so glad I chose her as my first person to come out to. Getting specifically to boy culture. Um, now, when I picked up a copy of the book, it was in the late 90s. I was living in Chicago at the time, and I bought it at a Northside Chicago uh, Borders bookstore. And one of the things I liked, of course, was the setting. You know, I had just, in fact, ridden the Jeffrey Six bus for the first time, and there in the <laughs> book, someone is riding the bus. Um, tell us, the, if you will, the origin story of the book and, and, and the process of writing it and getting it published. How did this all begin? Well, it goes back a long way. I was when I was at the University of Chicago, I was I, I wanted to get into a class um, about writing that was um, the lecturer was uh, Richard Stern, who was a, a great writer. And I didn't know about it until the last minute. The way I remember it was I had to write something with almost like in a day. And so I thought, well, I'll never get into this. But I had this story kicking around in the back of my head um, based on stories I'd heard from a real person. 
And I had also probably read Myra Breckenridge recently, uh, maybe even Faggots by uh, Larry Kramer. And I had this kind of idea to be very, to, to have a, a narrator who was very um, bold, um, provocative, confrontational, someone who's very different from myself. And I submitted the story and I got into the class. And then to my mortification, I had to read the story aloud to the class with all the dirty words and you know, sexual situations. And, you know, it was crazy because people thought it was autobiography, which was the funniest part. Um, but from there, I just worked on it into a novella. So it became my thesis to graduate. Again, a very, I think, a very unusual kind of a thesis for University of Chicago. And when I eventually worked for a book publisher was when I started getting more connections and following my book on Madonna, which had come out, I was able to, to place it as a novel. And, you know, and it's been with me ever since. And, and that, so that it started in 1989 with the story. The novel was published in 1995. And I just put out a 20th anniversary edition last year. 25th um, anniversary. I'm reading the uh, the anniversary edition now just because, yeah, we knew that you were coming on the program. But curious, I mean, how much of X was, you know, all novel or how much of it was, uh, you know, fantasies or maybe even, you know, some experiences? Well, you know, it at the time I, I first wrote this, I mean, I was so young. And, and even the, even the lecturer, he, Richard Stern loved my, my story and, and raved about it. But I remember he said, it's, he said, Oh, it's, it's, it's also just such a boy's story, you know, like a young man's story. And I was kind of offended at the time because it felt like it was belittling, but I look back at it and I think he was absolutely right that it, it does have a lot of sort of naivete, even while it's trying to come off as very edgy and um, out there and shocking. Um, but I think that the heart in it is, is mine. Um, there's a lot of stories. There are a lot of stories in the, in the novel that are sort of um, background information about the character that comes from, from me. A lot of that does. Um, but the inspiration was a, a friend of a friend who was from my home state of Michigan, from Detroit, who I found out had been, you know, having sex with his dentist for money. And I just thought this was such a crazy, you know, crazy thing. Uh, and it, that was kind of the, the beginning of um, how I envisioned that character. He was otherwise, he wasn't really like the character. He was a perfectly nice guy, although he was quite blank, which was, I think, characteristic of X. Uh, and that's and I also thought it would be a fun idea to to call the character X. So you don't really know what his name is. Um, but yeah, that that's that's where it, that's where it came from. That's how it started. So it was kind of, let's say, half and half is real and fake and the crazier stuff is fake. You were never prowling the streets of Chicago looking for customers. Yeah, no, I, I they came to me. No, no, <laughs> I, I never had that experience. I'd never had any kind of, I never spoke to a sex worker. I, you know, none of that was, was, was there in the novel. And then later when I did have more experiences and I knew more sex workers and was more educated about it, I think I got a lot of things right. You know, I think a lot of it was, was pretty close. There are some fantastic elements. I think the amount of money he was making, he was making quite a lot, <laughs> but it sort of makes sense because he was in a place where there weren't, there wasn't a lot of competition. Um, but that's why I think the series that we're, we're doing now is, is sort of an update of that too, because um, it's written by myself and by Q Allen Broca. And, you know, we're, we're adult men at this point, we've had a lot more experiences and, um, there's very little kind of wish fulfillment or fantastic stuff in it. Well, before we get to the new series, right. This, of course, there was a motion picture. So tell take us from the publication of the book. How was it received? What feedback did you get? And then how did it end up uh, as a motion picture? Well, I mean, it was, it was kind of like the perfect time for the book to be published because there, there was such a, a renaissance of, of queer fiction and so you, you could, if you published a gay novel, you, you were guaranteed to get some, you know, a decent amount of attention. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think you really have to do a lot to distinguish yourself today. Um, but it came out at a time when people were, were interested and were looking, you know, into like, well, well what is this stuff? So when it came out, I got a, a, a New York Times review, which was absolutely beyond anything I dreamed. I mean, it's like, 
first time authors back then would always say things like, well, get me on Oprah. And then I'll sell a lot of copies because, you know, my book is so universal. And that's how I kind of felt about the New York Times. I never would have dreamed of, you know, thinking something like that would happen. So it got a lot of great attention. I remember going into, you know, the, the Chicago, the gay bookstore, which doesn't exist anymore. How many do? And they had their own, their little list of, of the best sellers of the week. And so each week I'd go in and I would see it going up the list, you know, and, and, you know, it was number one for a while uh, to which, I mean, I owe a lot of that also to, it had a very sexy cover, a beautiful cover. Um, so that was kind of a great experience and it sold really well and went into paperback. And then um, not too long after that, it was option for film. Um, I had worked in Chicago for a literary agent named Jane Jordan Brown, who was a very old school, like John Birch Republican, but also like Bohemian. So it was a very strange mix. And so she was kind of my mentor in a lot of ways. And she was one who was able to sell the film rights. And once it was sold as a film, I think it took another close to 10 years for the movie to really come out. I had given up all hope by the time they were really shooting it. I couldn't believe there. I didn't actually believe it was happening and I didn't go to the set because I just couldn't believe they'd finally gotten to the point where they were shooting this thing. Um, and I regret that because, you know, I'm, I'm attached to the movie now. I, I think it's great. Uh, and then the movie came out and it did really well. And it had a, you know, a release in theaters and lots of cities across the country. Um, it's on box office mojo. It really happened. Uh, and it got good reviews. And again, we got a great, uh, probably our best review was in the New York times. So, um, it, it was a, it was a wonderful experience. And I guess I understand why people revisit their past successes because, and which, and which I'm doing with this is because it is such a great feeling, you know, to have that reception. There were people that didn't like it too, but that was part of it. I and mean, that was part of the fun was, was the fact that, I mean, I had written it as sort of a, I wanted to write it as sort of a beach read, but that was also something deeper masquerading as the beach read. So you could take it either way. You could read it as one or the other or both. And so because of that, you know, it has lovers and has haters and, and that was always in the plan. So it, it was a great ride. It's, it's very interesting. You know, you talk about like going back and um, uh, reminiscing about your successes and the projects that you were, were putting out at whatever age. So if we think about like the success of the novel in the late nineties and then the success of the movie and then um, I guess uh, around 2006, you said it's uh, right decade later. And then now it's a series. I mean, so much has changed culturally, even just for the gay community. I would be curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, why say in the late nineties, it became so popular. We just searching for ourselves. We saw ourselves in the book. We got to, maybe it was like part of the liberation movement. And then in 2000, I know that a couple other shows were popping up like Noah's Ark and even for lesbians, you know, the L word. Um, yeah, you know, kind of, did we grow together in this way? Well, I think it was kind of, and, and even if you look at the ones that you're mentioning, the other kind of things you're mentioning, I think sex sort of led the way for us and that it was, we use sex as, um, and, and sex felt more political to me at that time. Like it felt political to say like, yeah, I'm gay and I have sex with men and, you know, and this is what it looks like. And this is what a story about that is like. And so I think that kind of got everyone's attention and opened the door. And, and then by the time we get to the movie, 2006, you know, Will and Grace has happened, you know, things have, have kind of loosened up. So it's no longer as revolutionary to just have something to be about sex. And so when the movie came out, it was changed quite dramatically by the filmmaker, you know, uh, Hugh Allen Broca. And that was because he, you know, he decided to make it more universal. Like my original story was really very much about a white gay, you know, white gay culture. And by the time the movie was coming out, he was saying, oh, we've, we've seen this, you know, that's kind of boring. I don't want to do this again. He had done the eating out movies or one of them. And so one of the main characters was, was re completely reimagined as African-American and it made it much more of a, 
a universal story and it made it more, um, it just gave so many more people a way in to the story. And, and really it gained it a lot more fans, I think, than it would have had if it had been a literal uh, depiction of what I originally wrote. And we went through the same kind of thing, you know, working on the series. It's like so much has changed in the last 15 years. And I think that's reflected in the series. There's a lot more diversity, not just uh, of the people, but of, of the issues, you know? And again, and it can't just be about, well, like, like what's the sex scene going to be? We have to show some sex. You know, it's really not about that. It's about the complications surrounding sex and about love, sex, you know, complications surrounding falling in love. And um, it's like, it's just the, the envelope has already been pushed. So you have to push it further. That's, that's interesting. Uh, I think it was in the 90s, an author named David Gerald wrote a book called The Martian Child. And it was based on his real life story as a gay man who adopted a son who was a special needs son. And, and the, the title comes from the fact that the kid thought he was a Martian. Right. It's uh, working through this. Well, that eventually became a movie starring John, John Cusack. And they changed him, for, of course, from a gay, gay man to a straight man. Um, mm. So, And, I, you know, having part of the charm of the book was that the extra layer of complexity that added, knowing that he had extra hurdles to go over, um, at, you know, to adopt as a gay man back in the 90s. That was the Martian part. I'm surprised yeah. they changed it. Like, like what made him, I wonder what, what made the child feel so um, alienated in the movie. Like, I wonder what that was about. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, I know what you're saying. It's, um, you know, things, things are, are adapted and things are changed. Um, in my case, I think things broadened. So and, and that's what run, I was getting at. It kind of sounds the right like path. The yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, the changes you were making were, were you were kind of good ones and updating ones and stuff like that. You, you had mentioned that the origins of this book were you as a you know much younger person, much more naive. And so certainly if you were to have written it for the first time now, there that would be different. But do you think you would have done anything else different in the story you were telling? Or do you think kind of what you're doing now in the series reflects what you would have written as the book if you were writing it new today, if that makes sense? I can't really even imagine what I would have done if I were writing the story now, because it's, it's too simple of a story kind of to start now, you know, it's now we're expanding on it. We're building on something that was kind of the foundation from long ago, but it's not the kind of story I would start. I mean, look at something like, you know, the white Lotus, you know, like, and, and things that are popular now, things that are on TV, things that are, you know, that are books, things are a lot more complex, I think. And, uh, not are not afraid to take on a lot more controversial issues. So I think it would, it would, it would feel a lot more like what it was once called by, you know, the very savvy teacher. It would have felt more like kind of a boy's tale. It would have, it would have felt a lot less shocking than it felt at the time. You know, at the time I got all kinds of feedback about how it was so outrageous. And I remember my, my grandmother, my, my father went to my grandmother's house and saw that she had a copy of it. And he was like, why are you, what, you don't need to read this. And she said, I like to learn new things. Uh, so it was, it was considered quite racy. And, and I don't think that's really the case anymore. I mean, I think our series definitely has some juicy stuff in it. I, I can't deny that, but um, it doesn't feel like, like a central part of the, of the novel and of the short story was about shock. It was about a person. It was about a person who wanted to be seen as shocking. He was trying to be a shocker. And I think now we're following this person, you know, going from 25 to now he's 40 ish. He's not really so interested in that anymore. He's kind of settling down and, and kind of becoming a little more vulnerable and kind of thawing out a bit. So I think that's, that's a huge difference too. He's no longer just trying to be shocking. He's just trying to get along. He's just trying to survive. I giggle at 40 ish and, you know, settling down and in the, in at least my queer culture and, and small group of friends, I, mean, I feel like we're just getting started. <laughs> I know. I feel it's weird. I, I sometimes forget that I'm really old and it usually comes up. Like if I'm walking down the sidewalk and I see people walking by and they're just like, not even registering me. <laughs> like I'm not a part of it and you're not a part of this. Like don't even, don't look at us. Don't talk to us. Don't react. Um, and it's true though. It, it's, I, I, I still feel like I'm relatively close to being the same person I was 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that being said, I'm, you know, I shared with John this morning, um, 
actually when I came out in, in 2000 and I came out in San Francisco, I think the first thing I did was walk to the Castro and, and rented a bunch of movies, but like movies with sexual content and not, you know, for lesbians or for my own self pleasure, but because I really just wanted to know and understand the gay culture or our gay culture. And uh, I didn't think it was weird, but every single time you talk about, you know, sex as a queer person, I feel like people make it weird. Um, I don't know if you feel that or if the responses that you got when say, for example, the novel came out and, and, I just thought it was so brave because you're you're talking about, you know, gay people, gay sex, gay culture unapologetically. And in my opinion, during a time when even the most of our liberal supporters were like, no, you don't you don't get it right. (laughs) Right. I mean, I, I remember being really impressed by that. What you're talking about reading a boy's own story um, by Edmund White, because this was considered literature and it was in the university of Chicago bookstore. And I cracked it open and there was a very explicit scene about, you know, this, you know, young man losing his virginity, very mechanically oriented story. And I just thought, wow, so this, you can write about this and it can still be a book. It can still be a novel. It can be an important story. And maybe that's what makes it important. Maybe that's a a part of what really fuels that, you know, what's going on with that person. And, and I think that is important to keep doing. And I think people understand that more now. I think that's why sexual content is less frowned on than it once was. I mean, when I first published it, yeah, I had a lot of good reviews, but then I had a lot of people that dismissed it and just said it was porn, it was pornographic. And you know, I said, fine, you know, if it's if you think it's pornographic, maybe this person's story is you know, this way, this way, this way, then there's some porn and then other things happen. And then some porn, you know, like it's kind of like what life is like. We all have a little bit of a porn star in us, just whether there's a camera around or not, we all came from somewhere. So why not describe it? And certainly a different, uh, different world that your readers are all living in than say, you know, a hundred years ago where it's, it's any 60 years ago and whatever, where, people are maybe reading some of these classics and they're, they're reading between the lines to get, Oh, <laughs> that character must, I think they're doing something. <laughs> I think they're, they might've had sex. They might've been intimate. I don't know. Cause they won't say it. Um, whereas you, you're, you're really, well, which to in some parts of the culture and times that probably was real life. But I mean, you were able to get more at real life. I think of the nineties and two thousands by being able to actually talk about what people are doing. It's true. I mean, there's not a lot of reading between the lines in that novel. Uh, I, I reread it a few years ago, like when I was updating, you know, to, to do a new edition and it's like reading another person's words in, in some ways. Cause it's so, it's so long ago. And it's also like looking through pictures in, in your album and like what you used to look like too. You know, it just, it feels like such a, I was in a very different place when I wrote it. It was a very unique kind of voice that I had for that. The next novel I wrote sounded nothing like that, was was nothing like that, I don't think. Um, so yeah, and, and like you say, it is it is a different world. I, I hope that we'll be reaching a lot of a lot of younger people as well as older people with the series because it still has that original voice, but then I think it takes into account the times that we're in. Well, let's let's get into the new series and, and uh, let's watch, we've got a couple clips. So let's watch the first clip that you've brought from the new Boy Culture, the series. How did you find me? You gave us directions. We could smell your rotten carcass for miles. Rooting out evil is what we do. I hope you don't think I'll give up easily. Oh, I'm counting on you putting up fights. Hammerjack? And Tiger Bolt? Are you ready for a mouthful of justice? A combined 14 inches of justice. Good luck. You'll never pin me down, for I am Professor Trenchbottom from the impenetrable deep. <laughs> this confession is my hardest. 
So <laughs> I said before, do we need any introduction to the video? You said, well, let's play it and then talk about it. Tell let's us what we just saw there. And it ends with this confession is my hardest. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that's, I love that clip. That's uh, Ralph Cole Jr. is the actor who's playing a, 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 a client. I guess it used to be called a John, but the client. Um, and I think this, that clip kind of shows there's a lot of humor in the series. And you can see X, who's, you know, Derek Magyar on the left. X, who, who is such an iceberg, he's thought out a lot in the series. And part of it is because he's vulnerable because he's older and he's kind of clueless. So he's being taken on this, um, this job with this much younger guy who's a sex worker, Jason Caceres, uh, who plays Chase. And Chase is kind of leading him around by the nose. And so I think it's kind of amusing to see this guy who used to be sort of like the Greta Garbo of prostitution um, <laughs> showing up and being clueless and not even be able to like do like, what are we doing? Cosplay? What's cosplay? Isn't what this stuff is. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of fish out of water elements to it. So how did it turn into, you know, the idea for a series? Gosh, I think maybe even seven or eight years ago, I was talking with Alan about it and we sat down at a cafe. I was in LA and we started writing out scenes. And I think he came up with the idea that he wanted to do it. Like in the, the novel I have is arranged by confessions instead of chapters, but the confessions are things like confessing to vulnerabilities because the guy is so cold that he, he's sort of confessing like secretly, you know, I get upset about, you know, like he's confessing what, that he has vulnerability. So he said, well, instead, let's do it as, as each client. So we'll, we'll arrange each episode. It will be a different client. So there'll be some sort of um, a hook to what this client wants. We, you, we can't show all the clients because some of them are boring because when you're a sex worker, some of them are pretty straight laced. Um, but each of the ones that we show is someone who's asking for something that I think is, it gets at greater sort of, um, principles and issues in, in queer life, not just sexual. Uh, so that's how, that's how it started. And then it just took, you know, a number of years for us to vacillate and go back and forth. Do we really want to do this? Why do we want to do this? Then we had a Kickstarter campaign that was very successful and it took about a year, even after that to shoot it. Um, so it was shot actually, it's hard to believe I'm, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but it was shot three years ago. And then it took, it took a, a total of two years to edit the whole thing and have it be perfect. They wanted it to be perfect so that it was not so much a pilot as, you know, a, a completed thought. And it is, it's a complete thought. It's a six episode series, 15, epi 15 minute episodes. So if you watch it all together, which you can do at various film festivals, like Reeling F uh, Film Festival in Chicago is coming up. If you sit and watch the whole thing through, it's really like an episodic feature as well as a series. Um, and so this is the year, 2021 is the year that it's, it's out and about, it's going to film festivals and we're looking for, you know, appropriate streamers to, uh, to, to air it. You know, so many programs uh, where we've interviewed authors and filmmakers and such over the past 18 months, 17 months, whatever, we've always kind of gotten to the whole, well, has doing this during the pandemic, has that, is that, you know, been a hindrance? Some people have found it to be a help because they had, were able to focus and, you know, they're at home. What was it like trying to wrap up the editing and, and release this during a global pandemic? Well, I think the pandemic slowed us down a little bit, but honestly, it was mostly ready. It, it was, it was very cool. It was a decent, you know, it was a watchable piece of film um, before the pandemic hit. So we took so long that in, in the time it took for us to perfect this thing, a pandemic rose, <laughs> a, a vaccine was found and it started to dissipate. So I, I wouldn't say that the pandemic really affected us a lot, lot. I would say the last year, probably this could have come out a year ago at most, probably, probably it slowed us down by about a year, but we didn't do any filming at all during the pandemic. It was already done. It was all in the can. Uh, the actors all look the same you know, everything feels like yesterday. But I think the pandemic was sort of a, a, a neutral, neutral for us. Talk more about, you know, the changes and, and just because I feel like even you as a writer, you know, you've um, gone through your own experiences, the times have changed for us as a queer community, but also our uh, people who inspire us. I mean, is Madonna still the same 
you know, kind of goddess <laughs> that she once was to us in the, in the nineties. Uh, and, and the, it, it, like, there's so many others now, like I think Ariana Grande or, or, uh, you know, all these other names out there might be folks that we love to listen to when we are at the gay club, but we also now have our own like gay icons out there in pop culture, little Nas X parading around a pregnant belly, uh, to <laughs> promote, you know, his new album and, and just being so queer out there. Pregnant man felt like a story. Remember the pregnant man that felt like a, like this crazy story, you know, not that long ago. And now it's just completely commonplace. And it's, it's so, which in a great way, it's totally normal that we have an icon, you know, of our own who can promote himself that way, as opposed to being a tabloid, you know, sensation. He's actually promoting a huge mainstream album that way. It's, which is a great change. Um, yeah, I mean, everything has really shifted a lot in our favor. Of course, we're having a lot of pushback to that, but I think it's great to, I think you can keep all the old timers and um, hopefully and embrace the newcomers. I think that's where you get a lot of friction is when people, I really get sick of it because I'm in the middle, I'm in the midst of stan culture myself because I've written books about Madonna and I love Madonna. But you, it doesn't, it's not really about just that one person. It's about kind of who you were and how old you were when you first appreciated certain artists. Those are, you're never going to find anyone like that again because you're never going to be that age again. You're not going to be that impressionable again. Ariana Grande is amazing, but she's not going to do anything for me as an adult in the same way. Lil Nas X is a little different, is a little different because he's so new. Like he, he's a new kind of an entity, a, an actual queer queer icon um so that i can see hitting someone and making them feel great about it but i still think that a lot of older people when they see him a lot of the reaction is um i wish i had that at that age more than i love this now do you know what i'm saying i i think that i i'm really i'm really attached to that idea that we the people who hit us at the right moment in our lives those are the ones that we stay fiercely loyal to forever so if you're a young black person who loved um, Nicki Minaj, you're going to try to come up with reasons to excuse her when she promotes COVID conspiracy theories. You know, you're always going to kind of stick to that person. And, and I think stand culture is becoming more and more pervasive. And I think social media is, is fanning those flames because if you go on Twitter, it's a whole different world from the world that really exists and you can, it can seduce you into believing that the things that are on Twitter are reality and that, Oh, well, this is what everyone thinks. You know, this person is, is the best or this person is no good or this issue is going to fail or, and, and then you step away and you get an actual vote or you, or you get kind of a real world experience with it and you realize it's kind of an, it's an illusion. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a facade, you know, stand culture is like that, but I'm, I guess I'm always going to be fascinated by it because I do still follow all that stuff. Well, it's, it's interesting. You made it the, those points in that way, because I remember during the, somewhere during the, the, the turbulent Trump years in office, uh, one of the analysts on our political roundtable at the club, we were talking about, you know, how he, he just does X, Y, Z, unbelievably strange thing. You know, it, it completely goes against what he was doing last week. And yet his supporters stay with him. And this analyst said, Donald Trump doesn't have constituents. He doesn't have supporters. He has fans. Fans. It's true. And yes, they love that essence of him that they, they bought into a long time ago. And uh, they will be with him to the end. I love fandom. And I think it's fascinating. I think it's great when people are you know, you have, cause I, I associate it with youth and, and with newness. Like, I think it's great that you still have that youthful part of yourself that you can be just giddy about something and just be, you know, it doesn't have to be a singer. It can be, you know, a filmmaker or a novelist or anything, you know, I love that people are just, and you go, I love seeing that on, on social media when you go to someone's Instagram account and, you know, they're obsessed with miniature figurines or something, you know? So I love fandom. I love that people get really, um, into things. And I still try to keep myself open and be excited and go to concerts and be odd, but there is a poisonous element of it where if you really can't step back and even, even just express some disappointment, it, it seems like it's increasingly hard to criticize without 
people saying either, no, it's black or white. This person is either an angel or this person is a devil. Like it's, it's very hard to criticize. And, and I saw that with Hillary Clinton. I feel like Hillary Clinton is very similar to Donald Trump, that she has fanatics who just absolutely love her. And I'm sort of on that continuum. And then she has people who just hate everything she does. But when you do, when she did do something that I didn't like, you, you don't want to criticize her because you know that it's just an in for these other people to, to trash her. So there's a, that's a fan element. That's a, it, when it, when it, when you have to stop and think I shouldn't criticize this person because I know it's just going to like lead to people trashing them. That's kind of toxic. I think, I think it's, I, I, I miss being able to criticize people and not having someone say that's cancel culture or the opposite, or, you know, you know what I'm saying? I, I, yeah. I miss just being able to be critical. I miss being able to be upset about something and not have it all be minimized into some kind of juvenile, you know, new, new term, like, Oh, you're just, Oh, you're just a hater. You know, you're not a hater. Maybe you're upset because you like that person and they're saying something stupid, you know? So that's changed a lot. And I don't really know when that's going to end or how that's going to end. We're getting, we're kind of addicted to that. I think we're addicted to outrage, but we're also addicted to, we're also addicted to being outraged by outrage. So I think it's, I think it's kind of a mess. I don't know. I think it's maybe a social media driven problem. Mm -hmm. Does that play into X's character at all in the, in the series? And, and I'm I'm curious in this way where, you know, I almost feel like as an LGBTQIA plus person nowadays, I I have to have an opinion. I have to be outspoken. I have to be an activist. (laughs) What if I don't want to be an activist? And I just, like you were saying, I just, I just want to talk or, or something like that. Curious to uh, hear, you know, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing if, if any of it crosses over into the series and if it's changed X in any way. Well, I think X is sort of someone who thinks that he's always right. Although he's starting to realize that may not be the case. Uh, So he would probably be someone who would roll his eyes at outrage and at cancel culture. I think he might be one of those people who would be like, oh, that's cancel culture and blow it off, even when it's kind of a legitimate criticism. But I will say there's an episode where um, let's just say something happens that I think is is a shock. He's, he's asked to do something pretty shocking, much more so than what we saw. That was just kind of funny. Um, he's asked to do something. He's hired to do something that kind of goes against who, who he is and what he believes. And he has to decide if he wants to do that, but he does get caught. And so then he has to really talk it through and really kind of reason with his, um, ex-partner Andrew. Um, cause when the series opens, they've actually, they've actually broken up spoiler alert. Um, and we're, we're following them throughout the series to see if they get back together. He actually has to talk a little bit about these issues and about like if something is just politically incorrect or is political is political incorrectness. Is that a dismissive term? Like, is that a, is that a, a loaded term to even to even be talking about? So we talk about all, the, all that stuff a lot, I think. Well, why don't we watch the second clip you sent? And uh... oh, let's see what that is. <laughs> Okay, so let's see, let's see what this uh, next. I don't know why. I just wanted you to know I'm not normally the kind of guy who gets lap dances. I am married, and while all of this is very fun, it's just not my thing. But if it were my thing, I would spend a lot more twenties on you. That's why I'm your thing, huh? Well, I've never really been into twinks. Just daddies like me. I didn't mean that. You're not a daddy. You're just just an adult. Ah, so you're not into the kids? No, they're gorgeous. It's not an either or thing. It's just if I was gonna pick an ideal for myself, he would have some chest hair. So how long have you been married? Oh, uh, we've been quote unquote married for about 13 years. And uh, then we were in that first batch of prop eight couples that got real married right away. If you guys were together for so long, why'd you feel the need to get real married? It meant a lot to us. We, uh, we wouldn't have done it if it didn't. Are you married? I mean, to a guy or, or a girl? I know some sex workers are, are really straight. I'm gay, and I'm not married. 
Although I was with someone for longer than some couples are married, but it didn't work out. What happened? I think our timing was just off. Look, why don't you take my number? Because even though you said you're not into all this, we had a good time, right? And I think we could have an even better time if it was just one on one. Lucky for you, I'm not getting any younger. I won't tell your husband. Actually, I already got your information from, from that other dancer. Chase, I think, is his name. This is the exact moment I realized I had a pimp. <laughs> I don't know if there's much you need to explain on that, but, but it does kind of offer some Please interesting not. insight into them. How, well, where uh, where in the series does that appear? Is that toward that's the actually you know? right in the beginning. That's one of the, that's in the first episode. That's um, it. Kind of lays the groundwork for a couple of things. One is X is ruminating a lot about his age. Gay culture is notorious, notoriously. A, you'll find this a su surprise, but but <laughs> it, gay culture is notoriously ageist, and he's the fact that he's a sex worker is even more so. You know, an issue for him. He's getting back into things. So he's kind of having to get used to the fact that he's considered a daddy, um, which is maybe, maybe, or maybe not something I've had, I've heard from people in life. Um, but what I like, I really liked about the series. One thing that I really pushed. And I think I wrote a lot about was I liked the idea that he was being reintroduced to what it was like to be a sex worker by this much younger person. You know, this is like a 20 year old, played by Jason Caceres. Uh, he plays Chase. And the fact that even though he's at first, he just kind of meets him at a cattle call and they just sort of, he sort of, you know, takes advice from him. He doesn't even realize until that moment that this guy is really sort of pimping him out and is and sort of in control of, of his life. And I love the fact that someone who's half his age is knows a lot more and, and is sort of like a baby version of him because he's someone who is so uh, enamored of himself and, just like X was, you know, when he was, when he was young, when he was doing this, um, I mean, he's so young that, they, you know, he used to be a hooker. They don't even say that anymore. Like he, he's that kind of person who's, who's has to really stop and think about, well, how are things done now? What, what am I like, what am I called? How do I do this? How do I reach out to people? And, you know, in the old days, you know, when, when boy culture came out, he had all, X had all these private clients who he, you know, it was all word of mouth. He had a card, you know, he has, who has a card anymore, especially if you're a sex worker. Um, and nowadays, now he's learning about how you want to have an OnlyFans account. You know, you want to have an Instagram. You want to have all these different kind of social media accounts and other ways of, of meeting people. There's house parties. There's just things that are very different. And I, I think it we could have written many more episodes about the different kind of issues that have come up since... Um, 1995, let alone even 2006. I know, I know. I'm almost like it's going to become, you know, a thing on, on Netflix, right? That I could just binge over and over and over and over. Uh, <laughs> X looks so serious. <laughs> yes. In, in that, in that clip, at least, and it was a, a bit shocking, a shocking, especially compared to the guy who, is so out and so not serious, uh, and, and, but is married. So I love that, you know, the married elements that his clients or potential clients have changed, especially in the, the gay community, you go from, you know, having sex with your dentist to potentially having sex with a married gay guy. Yeah. And I remember, you know, in the novel, there was a, of course there was a dentist story, but then he also, there was a, um, a closeted military, a member of the military, which now you wouldn't have to be necessarily. You could be out and proud in the military. And he had a judge who was who was gay, which wouldn't necessarily raise eyebrows anymore either. So a lot of the closeted element, like he was basically servicing and or feeding off of or you know, he was looking for people who were kind of in closets. They, they were his biggest clients. And it's the opposite now. Like now people are, are hiring him just because on a lark, you know, oh, I want to have sex with a daddy tonight. I'll, I'll pick someone older. Um, and it's a whole different mentality. And it's I, I like the, the fact that he is so um, 
displaced by it. And he's still trying to do his sort of James Dean. You know, he, he has that very, I mean, that's Derek's choice, but it's also what X was like. He's, he's trying to be Mr. Cool and yet he is rattled and you'll see a lot of, a lot of times during throughout the series, you see X being truly rattled and, and then he either settles down into a slightly softer version of himself or he stays rattled on that topic. One of our viewers uh, comments, uh, looking forward to the series, any chance your other novel, Blind Items, might one day be adapted as a film or a series and who would be on your casting wish list? I did not write that question, but I could, <laughs> I might have, because that would be wonderful. I would love someone to option Blind Items. I have a big affection for that novel. It's about a guy who has a, and I wonder how that would have to be updated, but he has an affair with sort of like the, uh, sort of a, a, a TV heartthrob, sort of a, a David Charvet type. Um, and who would it be? I don't know who, I don't really know who I would cast. I, I would want, gosh, I want whoever's really famous, whoever's the most famous and most like, but it has to be someone who's actually gay. I think, I think for that, for that role. And that's another thing that should really be talked about is, you know, we, we've had questions about the fact that, you know, Derek is straight who plays, who plays X. We never had any question about that because he originated the role. And actually in the time since the, the first movie came out and now that whole topic came up and sort of is, I think it's starting to cool off a little bit because of the fact that there are so many more opportunities for gay actors. Um, it used to be that a, the reason you'd want to have a gay actor in a gay role is gay actors weren't even getting straight roles and we're getting gay roles. And then a gay role would come along and then give that to the straight guy. Uh, and luckily I think that's changing a lot. And kind of like Michelle mentioned with Lil Nas X, we have our own gay actors who are gay role models too, which is great, but I would want to get, I think I'd want a gay actor um, to play the clause. I can't think of someone really good. Who's a good, who's a TV actor or a movie actor who's gay who would be like a heartthrob who was in the closet. And I think it should be a period piece. I don't think, I think it should be in the nineties because oh. as hard as this is for me to believe and accept the nineties were 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. And people are obsessed with the nineties. I don't know why I hated the nineties. <laughs> I wrote a book called totally awesome eighties. I did not write a book about the nineties, um, <laughs> but I think that the nineties would be a lot. I think it'd be really fun to do a period piece that was kind of hyper, hyper nineties and, and bring up all those same topics. And, and I'd love that. I wish someone would option it. I have an idea of a uh, hunky gay, mysterious um, Wentworth Miller. Oh, that'd be great. Prison that'd be break. Great. Yeah. He'd yeah. be great for anything. I mean, he's just such a great actor and I haven't seen him in anything in a while. So it's higher. Yeah. yeah. He's um, attached. He's now officially <laughs> attached. <laughs> you haven't mentioned, I was thinking that you were going to mention Grinder in the new series. I don't know if um, Grinder makes, you know, uh, an appearance. It's a thing. Is it a focus? Well, we do have sort of a, um, we have a, a, a sex work site that's mentioned. It's not called, it's not Grindr. And Grindr people, I mean, I, I guess people, you, you do get approached on Grindr, you know, with people asking you to pay, or if you're really good looking, asking to pay you. Um, but I think Grindr is, is mostly free. So I, I, we, sort of, we sort of leave that out. Grinder, if anything, is a really big competitor. <laughs> it's a really big competitor for someone like X because there's plenty of daddies out there who are looking. Uh, and, and X really has to market himself as someone who knows what he's doing. So that's what makes him, that's why it makes it, you know, worthwhile hiring him because he's got experience. So this shows kind of cheap research, but Wikipedia says that there was a play that was being prepared of boy culture in the United Kingdom back in 2012. Did that come to fruition? It didn't, unfortunately. They, they did option it. They started writing it. And then uh, I'm not sure what exactly happened, what the reason was, but they did stop developing that. And that was, that was a shame. I was ready to go over there. I was going to fly to London just to see it. You know, I was, I was curious about that. Uh, Philip Pierce, who's one of the producers, along with um, Stephen Israel of Boy Culture, he's often encouraged me. I have the rights to the to do to do it as a play, 
And he's often said he thought it would make a great play. So maybe that will happen in the future. Or maybe it'll be a musical, since everything's a musical now. Boy culture, the musical. I can see it. <laughs> boy culture singing, right? Naked boy culture singing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, that kind of is a natural segue to what do you want to see this? Where do you see this? You know, could you this be, and is this boy culture, the series, which is a limited series, is that kind of a pitch for an ongoing series? And if so, what do you think would be the perfect platform for? Is this a streaming channel thing? Is this, do you see it on TV? I mean, cable, what's your thought? Well, I mean, when we first shot it, I think there were two schools of thought. One would, would be, we'll shoot this. It'll look great. And they'll air it the way it is. And it'll be a first season and maybe we'll get picked up for a second. And, you know, there was, between the time that we came up with the idea and the time that it was shot special came out, which was on Netflix. And we thought, well, that's really very similar to what we want because it's that had shorter episodes. It's very queer and it made it onto Netflix. So Netflix was always in our mind as a possible um, streamer for us. So that was one school thought. And the other school thought is that we make this amazing sort of highly produced pilot and someone buys it and then they reshoot it. And it's completely redone and obviously with the same actors and all of us attached. And, and then it goes on as a series that way. But I think the, the, the former is much more likely where we're looking to place it, you know, obviously something like Netflix would be ideal. We want to place it with a streamer and we'd love to have more than one season. We'd like to have it go on. It definitely, I can't, I mean, without giving a lot of weight, it ends on a, a major sort of a cliffhanger. It does, it does leave you wanting more, I think. I think the I think the last episode of this is the most impactful, and it's definitely the best. Um, I think that's the best acting between the the stars Daryl Stevens and Derek Magyar. They have the really powerful scenes um, because you're waiting to see if they're going to get back together, and so the last episode is really juicy. So yeah, that's that's what we see. You know, we we would love to to have this be a multi season series. And one more follow up before I let Michelle talk again. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. Um, do you see yourself writing sequels to it? Books, novels? Um, I don't. There's no reason I should. I should just do that because, you know, it's hard to get things published these days to just come up with a new, a completely new idea and write it. But I, I have I am pretty boy cultured out as far as do I really want to continue this? I mean, I love it. I, the idea of continuing it as a series because I'm really psyched about the way we came up with um, how to present that. But the idea of another novel, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if that would have a huge market and I know it would take me a long time and it would take a lot of energy. Uh, Instead, I I've been working on a screenplay. I'm I'm basically done with a screenplay, which is completely unrelated to that. And boy culture, the series was my first, my first screenwriting credit. So that got my feet wet and got me really interested in, helped me learn the format, which is one of the, the biggest drawbacks. I mean, I remember in high school, I bought this book on how to write screenplays thinking I was going to be, you know, I was going to write the next Chinatown. And I kept that book forever as if buying the book meant that you were on your way to doing it. You know, that's not really part of the work. Um, so I, I think I, I see myself going in that direction more. Um, and I, I, you know, I've continued to do nonfiction books from time to time too. Do you want a sequel? Should I do one? I, I want another book from Matthew. If you can't say yes immediately, then I'm not. Well, I say yes. I mean, I think okay. that um, I, I feel like, you know, people are hungry for our stories and people are more curious. People are out more. People are being themselves and expressing. And so I love what you had to say about, you know, gay roles and gay actors and being casted. Uh, if you could... Talk about, you know, maybe what your thoughts are in, in Hollywood. We know that there are more queer writers out there. There are uh, queer showrunners. Um, do you think that, right, our, our stories, us being behind the scenes, us getting the roles, it's increasing, it's, it's happening. We could really, you know, be something that we once thought we couldn't be. Yeah, absolutely. And like, just as one example, with the, with the movie, I know they had trouble casting. They had trouble finding people to play the parts and that included gay actors. So we were trying to get gay actors too. And, and they would be like afraid to play gay. 
And when we did this, you know, the series, I don't know how many speaking roles there are th- across six episodes, but there's a number, there's quite a few. It's not just these three people. And I believe every single, every single person who speaks in the series is queer in real life, except for Derek X. So that's a lot of people and all of the creatives behind it. We're all gay or, or I think we're all gay and we're all definitely all LGBTQ. And, and so there's just so many of us around now, it is like a whole different world. Um, and I, I do, I do see that becoming, you know, expanding more and more each time something new happens, like pose so each time there's a new, you know, stride made, we all kind of stride with it. So I might as well just throw this in, in there, you know, uh, I, I love where our community is going and the way that we are telling our stories. It's a lot more inclusive. Like I feel like writers are trying to include more than just the, the gay perspective or the lesbian perspective, but also, you know, the trans um, perspective in it and it's history. And so what I, what I wanted to ask you is that, you know, uh, do you ever get trapped in, in, in trying to be too gay or too queer or too inclusive when you're, you know, writing stuff? Well, it's, you know, I, when I wrote the first novel, even at that time, I remember there was a conversation going on about, um, about diversity, although it was new, it was, it felt new to me anyway. And I, I felt sort of, I felt sort of like, and this is the other school of thought is I felt strange writing about people who are too different from myself because I sort of felt like, and I didn't have these words at the time, but I sort of felt like, is this even my story to tell? And so if I did that now, like if I wrote a, if I wrote a big sweeping, let's say multi-generational novel and it had lots of different, you know, people of different gender identities and um, races and, you know, just had, and, and wrote all those people. I wonder how that would be received because they would say, well, you know, why are you the one who's writing this? So I think it may be pushing people more toward collaboration, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so I don't really feel trapped by it, but it's certainly, it's a consideration. It should be a consideration anytime you're creating something, you know, like you don't want, there's no such thing as being too inclusive, but there can be such a thing as doing it in a way that doesn't really feel organic or that doesn't really express you or that, somehow accidentally feels like it's trying to express someone else who may, may take offense, you know, maybe upset. You're asking me about pop star magazine when I worked as a teen editor, Yeah, but my interactions were like, so, um, I launched a teen magazine at a porn company in, in as one uh, does. 1998. It was very more common than you think. Um, and, it was sold eventually. And so then I worked for, I worked for a total of about 14 years on pop star, which was a, a teen entertainment magazine, largely for girls. I'm sure for a lot of gay boys too. And it was really just a joy because I can be very cynical and you know, that, that was just like the opposite of that. It was sort of a purely escapist, purely positive thing to put into the hands of a kid. And this was a big responsibility but it was fun too, because like when I was a kid, I thought, Oh, I'd love to be like, I was thinking, Oh, I'd love to be around celebrities. And so I finally was, but there were celebrities I didn't care about so much because they were younger than me, you know? So they, like we talked about earlier, someone who's a really big star is not really going to impress you be, you know, if they're like <laughs> your child, the age of your children. <laughs> um, but what I loved about it was, you know, it's, I loved the fact that the readers were really into what we were giving them or selling to them. But I also love the fact that you could, you were putting these, you know, young people into a magazine, to a national magazine and just thrilling them. Like they loved it. So it it was such a positive kind of a thing. Um, And then I met everyone, you know, whenever I run into people in their twenties now, and I talk about that, they're just, it's a great conversation starter because, you know, they have all their opinions on Ariana Grande and One Direction and Zac Efron and Hillary Duff and Jonas Brothers and anyone. And then going even further back to like 98 Degrees and Sync and Backstreet, Britney, you know, I have all these great one on one experiences with a lot of them. So I can tell them what they were really like. And I can usually they're, you know, it's very positive. They're really nice. Um, but on a pers- in a personal way, I think what working for the magazine and meeting all these celebrities 
did was it, it actually was more of a, and I think this is true with a lot of celebrity journalism is it becomes sort of a, a self-esteem litmus test because you, you, because you're not, you don't really care about that person. You don't want to like, you know, just be around them just to absorb their fame because they're just, they're way after your time, but you do kind of get into this loop of wanting them to acknowledge you and want their publicist to acknowledge you and you want to have access. So you start to associate it more with, does this person remember me? Do they remember I put them on the cover? Like, am I going to get an hour with this person or is it going to be 20 minutes? So it is kind of a, I have like a funny, I think I have a lot of great stories from that, that period. And I'm actually looking into doing a project that is very directly related to the, the teen magazine scene of the nineties too. That's another thing I'm working on. Matthew, we had such a blast chatting with you. Uh, one very last question though, of all the celebrities um, that you've talked about that you've interviewed or that you would want to interview. I mean, is there one that you would, I don't know, would, your knees would buckle for? Well, I'm a Madonna guy. I have met her and I actually was at a round table interview with her. So I did get to ask her interview questions, like two questions. That was my knees did buckle. Um, <laughs> I get nervous before everything. I, I mean, yeah. I just went to the premiere of the eyes of Tammy Faye and there's, there's nothing, there's no pressure. Like I know that whatever happens, it's going to be fine. And I was nervous. And like, would Jessica Chastain stop for us? And, and she did, you know, and it was fun. And, you know, I loved her, but anyone I'm still waiting for, I think I've met all the ones I really need that, that, that really are really deeply meaningful to me. And once I, once I met Madonna and Obama, everything else is gravy. Yeah, that is so awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I know you made John's day, made my day, and now I get to go back and uh, revisit boy culture. And so all of you should as well. And if you don't know about boy culture, well, lucky you, it's out there. You can get boy culture, the novel, you can go back and watch boy culture, the movie. I, I watched it this morning on Amazon prime. And now there's a series and uh, I think the series will be available soon ish for now. How can we follow, just follow your Twitter? Yeah, it, actually you can come to my website, boyculture.com. And it's going to be, it's at a lot of film festivals. It's at, it's at reeling in Chicago on the 24th. And I'll be there if anyone wants to come and say hello. All right. That's so awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. And thank you to all of you for joining us here on the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. For more programming, head to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. We'll see you next time.